Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. Of course, also Happy New Year. So this is 2022, yet another year. So let's hope for the best that it will be a better one than 2021. Um, we start with a new topic with the Gaussian processes. And um, that is a fun topic. However, um, there are different levels of understanding them. And let's see how far we get. So I will try to derive the relevant formulas, but as you know, um, even though by heart I'm a mathematician, I try to do it a little bit hand wavily so that you get the intuition. And part of it is that I think it's easier to understand. And the other part is that for the GPs, I don't know how to write down the mass. And I will point out the difficulties along the way that I have. And um, similar difficulties are also there if you look at the main reference, which is this one. So Gaussian Process for Machine Learning, really nice book from Karl Rasmussen um, and Christopher Williams from University of Cambridge and University of Edinburgh. And um, they have also very nice introduction to the topic. Yeah? The best thing about the book is it's uh, completely available online. So you can download the PDF completely legally from the Cambridge website or maybe from the website of the authors. And they give a very nice introduction in here. And I'm kind of following along the book, but kind of reshuffling the way I present it. And I'm also using, in my opinion, slightly better notation, but one can argue with that one. Okay, so I'm, I'm sometimes use slightly different notations, but most of the time I'm using basically exactly the same notation because they really nailed it down how to explain it really well. So what is Gaussian processes? First of all, what problem do we want to solve? Gaussian processes is a method to solve regression problems. Okay, so in a regression problem, we are given some data set of X and Ys, or as computer scientists, we would say of inputs and outputs. As statistician, you might say of locations and values. So there are many names for this as we've seen already. And basically, this is describing a function going from x to y. And we kind of want to find a nice line through this, right? If we would do linear regression, we would just fit a straight line through this. If we would like uh, having also some polynomials or something, we could have like a squared function fitting here or something. If you also want to get this wiggly thing over here, um, in that case, uh, possibly we want to have something that also allows some sharp edges. And then what's the point of all of this? So regression is useful kind of to find a functional relationship. Of course, in machine learning, the functional relationship is then afterwards maybe described by a neural network, which is just a black box and you don't understand anything about the function, right, right from fitting it. You can fit it very well and you can interpolate very well also in higher dimensions, but you don't really know maybe what the meaning of these things is. So in Gaussian processes, if you carefully design at the end your kernel functions, you sometimes also get information and about properties of this relationship, as we will see next time. I think today we won't get that far. Okay, first of all, um, the starting point is of Gaussian processes is the word Gaussian, right? So let's have more fun with Gaussians, right? So in a way, a Gaussian process generalizes a multivariate Gaussian distribution. As you know, the multivariate Gaussian distribution generalizes the univariate Gaussian distributions from having Gaussian distributions on a single real number to a vector of real numbers. Now the Gaussian process will generalize the multivariate Gaussian distributions towards functions. So we want to have distributions over functions, okay? That first sounds a bit weird, and that's also where the difficulty in notation comes from, because we want to write something like the probability of some function. And somehow there are limits of writing things down. At least I have these limits. I don't know how to write these things down, but let's see how we, how we get along. So let's first repeat, what was the multivariate Gaussian distribution? So basically it's the distribution that is defined on the space of vectors, X. So X is a vector from R to the M, for example. And then for example, we would write X is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution with these two parameters where those two parameters now have particular properties. So the mu is basically coming from the same space as my x, okay? So it's just one representant of these possible vectors that are they, and it's the one that is in the center that kind of describes the, the center location of my data set. 
And then there's the sigma, which is the covariance function. And this covariance function is then an M by M matrix. So if my data space is M dimensional, so my covariance matrix will of course be M by M dimensional. That's kind of explaining, telling us something about the variance in the different directions. Now in a Gaussian process now, we want to define a distribution of the space of functions. Now, what functions are we looking at? We're looking at possible functions that solve our regression problem, okay? So we want to have a Gaussian distribution of a function that will then fit our data very well. The curious thing here is that here's the transition from going from the discrete world into a continuous world, right? Um, so the Gaussian processes is a continuous variable in a way. So it's really a different thing in a way. Of course, for computer scientists, you could say, okay, F is a symbol and a symbol has a value and the value could be a function, right? I mean, that's what we learned from functional programming. And this perspective or keeping this in mind will be useful. The other transition from discrete to continuous is the data sets are typically discrete, right? We have typically discrete length tables of data that we record somehow, or we have a finitely sized hard drive, which is full of data where we want to do regression on, but it's always finite. And so there's always something discrete. So and we want to transition from some discrete object like our data set into the continuous world, which is also kind of exciting. Okay, so how do we write it? We write it very similar. We would also say F is a symbol, but this symbol now is going over the space of function. In this case, from some vector space R to the M to the real numbers. Okay, but if I have a distribution over this space of functions, of course, if I go to the R to the N, to some higher dimensional space, I would have for each coordinate like a function F and I'm going back to this special case. So the difficult step is going from these vectors to these functions. For the notation, we also try to mimic our notation up here, okay? So instead of this N for normal distributed, we would now write GP for Gaussian process. And instead of having a mean vector, we will have this letter M and this letter M now, let's look what it is. It should come from the same space as the F. The, the F comes from the space of functions. So the M should be also a function and we call it the mean function, okay? Similarly now, for the K, which was a covariance matrix, now this becomes a covariance function, okay? Defined on the space R to the M cross R to the M. So it will have two inputs, vector valued inputs. And this K, you might ask, so why K? So that's weird, right? Why not call it C or something or S or whatever? The reason being, these K are exactly the kernels from support vector machines. So like the Gaussian processes, they are like the Bayesian world style support vector machine way of thinking. Or let's say, let's rephrase it differently. The using the kernel trick uh, for support vector machine is the same as using these covariance functions like for Gaussian processes, okay? So they are really in parallel. In particular, it means, so this covariance functions, they are exactly the kernel function. So if a function is positive semi-definite or positive definite, then you can use it here as a covariance function, okay? So here, when you choose parameters for multivariate Gaussian, you pick some vector from the same space and you need to pick a positive definite uh, matrix for the covariance. And um, similarly here, when you want to specify Gaussian process, you can pick any function and you must plug a kernel function in here. So that's why it's called a K, okay? And so these are basically like the, the way how we would write that F is distributed according to a GP. However, stuff like P of F, right? So that's still kind of feeling fuzzy and it stays fuzzy. And instead we will talk about P of vectors and then by matching the right terms, we will translate everything into a function space view, okay? But let's first go on. So how is the PDF of the multivariate Gaussian defined? So it's this typical definition that you've seen a zillion times. So we need to write down. Uh, so how is the distribution defined? It's defined by its PDF. So we write down um, such a function, which is basically telling us um, how likely it is to, to uh, how likely is not the right word, but if the PDF is large, 
in a certain area of my vector space where my vectors x live, then there's a high probability of seeing points nearby. Okay, that's basically it. Now, how could we define Gaussian processes? I mean, what could we write down? What kind of function where we plug in an f, an m and an k, what, what could we have here? So that's like mathematically quite difficult to do now because it should be a function where the inputs are other functions, right? Again, as computer scientists, we are fine with that. It's fu called functional programming. And that's really the idea that you could keep in mind. But like writing it down mathematically is not so simple. And here we do something that people do in mathematics quite often. So you have some really well understood in the finite world, in the discrete world. Um, now you want to define something for the continuous world. And then somehow you collapse every function onto the finite world. So let's see how it goes. So here's now our definition. So what is a Gaussian process with some given mean function and some given covariance function? So it is a probability distribution of our functions in the following sense, such that if I take finitely many locations x1 to xn, yeah, and calculate for those finitely many ex, um, locations, I apply my function f, okay, onto them, then I get a vector. And now this vector should be Gaussian distributed. That's it, okay? So for all finitely many locations, if I apply my function f, then basically it should be Gaussian distributed. So where is here the randomness? The randomness is in the f. So the f is the stuff that is varying here, okay? So the x1 to xn are fixed, and then if you say f is Gaussian distribu uh, is distributed according to a GP, yeah, in that case, it should correspond to that for finitely many locations, the vector should be Gaussian distributed. Now you could ask, so what mean, what covariance should it have? And of course, yeah, the mean vector is just by plugging in all these locations into the mean function, and the covariance matrix is given by evaluating the kernel function. So this is very much like the definition that we've seen for kernel functions where we defined what is a positive semi-definite kernel function and it was defined you, you take arbitrary many but finitely many locations and basically you evaluate your kernel function at these locations and you would say the matrix should be positive definite that you get and it should be positive definite or semi-definite for all possible choices of locations. So similarly to the definition of positive definiteness for functions, the definition of Gaussian processes is using basically the same trick. Yeah? So let's go through the whole thing again. So a Gaussian process with mean function, blah, 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 it's a probability distribution over functions with the following property. If I collapse my function onto finitely many points, I get a random vector and the randomness comes from f being random, okay? And then this finite dimensional vector has a Gaussian distribution with, I would call it, canonical choices for the mean vector and for the covariance, yeah? And canonical because, I mean, we have a mean function, so let's use it to calculate the mean vector and we have a covariance function. Yet let's use it to calculate a covariance matrix. Okay, so that is the definition of a Gaussian process. Of course, it would have been nicer to write down like a, a density function or something, right? But that's unfortunately not possible with these functions. Or maybe you can do it. If you can, please send it to me. I will put it into the lecture if you find it somewhere, okay? So maybe just you need to write the right way of thinking about it to play around with notation and stuff. And then you could also maybe write down an, a, a density, right? I mean, the density must fulfill that if you integrate over all possible functions, so this integration over the space of functions must be defined and all of these things. So it's a kind of a puzzle, yeah? whether it's possible or not. But, but I don't know how to do it. I only know of this definition that we collapse it onto the um, finitely, um, finitely many locations. So now this is a definition of a Gaussian process. However, it does not imply directly that a Gaussian process does exist, right? We don't know whether these objects really exist. And actually people were using these Gaussian processes already for a long time before someone came up and wrote a paper on there exists this distribution exists and I can construct it somehow for some means. 
And there's some more mathematically inclined paper. If you want, I can send you the pointer into the rocket chat where you really prove that these objects also exist. Okay. And typically in mathematics, what you want when you have a definition like that, you want uniqueness and existence results. So you want to make sure that if you have two, um, two objects, which possibly have this property here, yeah, that they correspond to this Gaussian distributions, that there's only one of them. And you want to kind of prove that if you have a function M and a um, kernel function or covariance matrix, a covariance function K, that there really is a corresponding object to it. But luckily we are computer scientists. We don't have to worry about uniqueness and existence results. We are happy if at the end we have a nice algorithm which works on our finite machines called computers, right? So we just use the mathematics kind of to get good insights and to get great methods. And then we collapse it down typically onto finitely many locations. And then we are in the Gaussian world anyway, right? However, then from that perspective, a GP is a very clever way to write down like many, many Gaussian distributions, right? Instead of specifying lots of mean values and lots of covariance matrices for different locations, yeah, you could um, just write down a function. And why you sometimes want to specify many means and many variables, I want to give you an example on the board. This regression example. So in principle, so here we have these two axes, x, x and y, and suppose we have these data points here, those are your data points, okay? Then now where are here interesting Gaussian distributions? So for example, those are my measurements, yeah? And suppose my measurement, I have some measurement error on it, okay? So even though there might be a true functional value, there might be a true f of x, let's say the y is actually equal to the true functional value plus some noise. And let's say the noise, is Gaussian distributed, okay, with mean zero and sigma squared variance, then here's my first Gaussian distribution. I could draw a line here, yeah, and I could say, so here's the Gaussian distribution, okay, at this location, at this point. So my measurement is sampled somehow from the true value, which might be that one. So that might be the true f of x, and here might be another one where this is the true f of x, and here I'm having a different Gaussian distribution, so that's the f of x3, this is the f of x2, if that is x2 and x3, and here I have yet another one, x1, okay, and there I could also draw a Gaussian distribution. Of course, my function f, typically I could visualize like having a line through it like this, right, but now let's say I also want to visualize these, these um, measurement noise, okay, then I would now draw A margin around it, okay, and this margin has nothing to do with the margin from support vector machines, but it's like a, like visualizing basically the mean at every location plus a standard deviation, okay, and here minus a standard deviation, okay, so it's plus standard deviation minus standard deviation. Now that would kind of describe overall the measurement process, right? But now what about the inference? Suppose now. We know those are our measurements here. So where are other interesting Gaussian distributions? So that Gaussian distribution at every location could be described by the single parameter sigma squared, right? But now let's suppose, okay, so this is my data, great. And I'm doing regressions through it, great. So I'm getting this, this interesting looking function. Now, somehow here I have more information, right? So here I have two data points and here's one lonely data point. So maybe after seeing this point and that one, the variance at this location should be even smaller. I should be more sure about my estimation. So in principle, maybe also this might be some interesting meaningful tube where I'm having like a wider variance up here in the middle here, I'm having a really large one. And then here I'm having a small one. So now this variance here is telling me something about the other data points. So for this location here, my estimate of my functional value in here has a large error bar. And now this error bar is a combination of my measurement error and of my estimation error that I get from, okay, here I'm quite far from everyone else, but here I'm getting closer. So in principle, here's a, here kind of the, the 
my uncertainty is kind of getting smaller, okay? Because I'm closer to one of my observations. Similarly, here I'm closer to one of my observations. Now, what about here? So here I would expect kind of, even though I have an estimate maybe of my function, that the variance really goes very large. So now, what did I draw here? So I have three data points, and then basically now, these three lines that I've put on the board, they are visualizations now of a GP, okay? So the GP is described by a mean function, which is this line in the middle, which nicely fits the data ideally. And at every location here, I'm also having like the variance. I'm also getting the error. And the interesting thing is not only the error where my data is, but in particular interesting where I don't have the data, okay? And now you see that some of the variance here, which is something like the sigma, yeah, that is now really a function as the location varies, okay? So in a way, that is, um, those are the values on the diagonal, and the diagonal at, in my covariance function is where I plug in two points here. So if I have a new point x star, I could calculate the k of x star comma x star, yeah? And then this will describe me how sure is my estimate of my mean function that I kind of estimated, okay? So that's like a cartoon view where we might, might get back at some point. Good, so far so good. Um, having defined the Gaussian process, of course, now again coming the mathematician. Now, what about the d-dimensional multivariate Gaussian distribution? Is it a special, uh, special instance of a Gaussian process? So can we go down? Yeah, we, we were able to go down from the multivariate to the univariate case. So the univariate is a special case of the multivariate. Now it would be nice if the multivariate is also a special case of the Gaussian process. And the answer is yes, because in principle, we could view vectors as functions, right? And the functions are quite simple. The input is just a finite set from one to D and the output is the real numbers. So in a way, if I view this as my input locations, then I could view any vector as a function, okay? And now saying, okay, what possible um, finitely subsets do I have here? So if that is, can I really define this to be a GP? Then I, I could, I, I should be able to pick like finitely many um, locations, yeah, for the definition here, these finitely many locations. And if I pick them from the subset of one to D, a subset would be, for example, two comma three comma four. So that would be a subset. And for all of those, my data must be Gaussian distributed. So is that a property we have for multivariate Gaussian distribution? Yes, we do. That's basically the statement that if you have a multivariate Gaussian distribution, all marginal distributions are also Gaussians, okay? So if you have a, a 10 dimensional Gaussian distribution, and you only look at three coordinates, even arbitrarily rotated, the result will be a Gaussian distribution too. Okay, so for that reason, yeah, um, the multivariate Gaussian distributions are also a special case of the Gaussian process. And again, this is a bit hand wavy, right? I mean, before this is not a finite set, but those are the real numbers on the previous slide. So there's some hand waviness involved. But the reason being, of course, this definition could have been done much more general by plugging something in for the R to the M, right? I could say this must be like a Hilbert space or whatever space with inner product or with this and that. So there are some mathematical properties that it must fulfill. For concreteness, I put the R to the M because that's like the, the, the place where we typically apply it. However, recall from the kernel functions that in principle, anything could go in here, right? as soon as if you take finitely many objects, the corresponding covariance matrix is positive definite or positive semi-definite. Yeah, in that case, the K is the kernel function. So the X1 to Xn could be fish or could be text or could be genes or could be whatever you like. So if you define a kernel function like that. And the same applies for a Gaussian process. So if you can define a mean function and a kernel function, yeah, in that case, you are in business and you can use GPs for your data set. However, for simplicity, let's think about the input as being vectors. In principle, there could be also finite sets. There's no problem with that one, as long as the properties are fulfilled. 
Good, so multivariate Gaussian is a special case of a GP. Why do we care for this property? Because it kind of gives us a good feeling that the definition is kind of good, right? So if something that we know already is a special case, then typically the generalization was a good idea. So now how do we do probabilistic inference with Gaussian processes? We've seen it with um, Gaussian, multivariate Gaussians, we've, where you kind of, for example, say your mean is also Gaussian distributed and then you have observations and then you do some probabilistic inference. Let's do the same thing. So the probabilistic inference general <clears throat> recipe is the following. There's some stories, so here's the data. We want to learn something about a functional relationship or something. Then <clears throat> before observing data, <clears throat> excuse me, we first have to specify a prior and a likelihood. So where the prior is kind of summarizing everything we know about the model so far, for example, it should be a smooth function. So that could be our prior information. And then there's the so-called likelihood, where the likelihood is telling me, okay, given that I have a certain location, what is the distribution of my observation, right? So the measurements are typically expressed by the likelihood. And then when we do inference, we just use the formula that is given for deriving the posterior distribution. And we can use a formula to get a distribution for the posterior predictive distribution. So posterior here would be that you plug in, you say my prior distribution is some GP. Maybe I should switch. Oops. So my prior distribution might be a GP with some certain mean function. Let's call it M sub zero and K sub zero. And then after seeing some data set, where I'm here using our um, linear regression notation, the distribution of the F changes and it will be some other GP now with a new data, uh, with a new mean function, which is now updated after seeing N data points and also with some other covariance functions. So not only the mean function changes, the one that goes like this, but also my covariance function changes. So this one up here is just coming from the measurement noise. So that's the tube that is the same everywhere. However, after seeing certain data points, my covariance function also changes. So depending on where there's lots of data, the variance is small, and where's not so much data, the variance could be quite large. Okay, so that is typically what we're doing. Now I put it already on the board. Basically now the question is, is it the case that if my prior is a GP, the posterior is also the GP? The short answer is yes, we are lucky. So with Gaussians, everything is nice. So if my prior is a Gaussian, my posterior is a Gaussian. If my prior is a Gaussian process, also the posterior is a Gaussian process, which is great. Then do we have formulas for these? Yes, there are some nice formulas and they resemble the formulas that we've seen already for the Gaussian distributions, which you might remember are horribly complicated with inverse and stuff. Now we get the same thing, the same beauty of inverses and complicated stuff, but with functions, right? Wow, that's great. That sounds so cool. So let's see how the formulas look like. Again, I think you don't have to remember them, but recognize them would be good. Good, so let's follow, let's continue here with the slides. So here's a, the probabilistic inference for Gaussian processes. So here's the story. The story is we are given some regression problem. So we have an input outputs, and we want to learn something about functions f, and we want to learn something about predictions at some other points. So these other points could be either at these locations where I am already, then my problem is called interpolation. I want to interpolate between data points, okay? Or I want to extrapolate outside to the unknown, yeah? That's, that are also test points that I'm interested in, right? So one example from the book, and uh, we might also look at it next time in, um, in some data sets is some CO2 data from Hawaii, right? Which is some nice curve. And you know it maybe only until 2021 and you want to extrapolate the data to the future and you want to make a climate model, for example. And of course, GPs is a nice tool for doing this. So the prior, let's write it down, okay. We are fine with that. Okay, we specified a prior. So F is distributed according to a Gaussian process with parameters M being a mean function and K being a covariance function, or as we said before, a kernel function, which is exactly the same thing. Yeah, so that's fine. That basically means if I 
collapse my f onto finitely many locations, I'm having a multivariate Gaussian distribution with the canonical parameters that we get from the mean and from the covariance function. So far so good. Um, then there's the likelihood. The likelihood is just a univariate Gaussian. So I can evaluate my function here. If I'm given the function, I can evaluate at it my location x, f of x, I can call it, and I get a location. And at that location, with certain measurement noise, I'm getting my observation y. Okay. So the f is describing basically how nature acts, like the physical law or something. And the likelihood is describing my measurement process, right? And that's the same as before. Before, for example, when we were doing inference about um, whatever heights of students, how, how, how tall you are, okay? We would say there's like nature's law, how tall like typical Düsseldorf students are. And we might have some prior information on that and it might be Gaussian distributed, okay? And then given that we have this law, yeah, this random distribution, our likelihood was the measurement process, how crappy my Zollstock is, how crappy my measurement device is, or whether I'm using a laser, or how, how safe I am with my measurements, okay? And then the sigma could be very small or very large. And as you know, you can derive from those two assumptions when you have Gaussians, a posterior distribution, which is again Gaussian, where now the variance is basically influenced by our measurement noise, and by our initial uncertainty about the prior information, okay? And here the same happens. And one can show, we won't, but one can show that actually the posterior happens to be a Gaussian process again with some new mean function and new kernel function, okay? And now the rest of the lecture will be to come up with good expressions for those two, okay? And we don't rigorously de um, derive them, but we kind of will match them starting from the finite case, looking at the formulas and then translating them to the function view and then reading off basically the right forms, okay? Which is not a rigorous way to derive them, but I think a very intuitive way because it ensures that the finite case is a special case of what we are going to derive. The second thing, as I said, is a posterior predictive distribution. And that is basically now saying, so what is the function value, for example, the CO2 um, uh, amount, uh, the, the amount of CO2 in the air in 2023, given yeah, that I have the 23, so that is the 23, that's the X, that's my location on the time axis, given that I have already data from previous years where the data is stored in the Y and the locations where I measured are the X. Okay, so given my data. And now again, where is the GP going? So the GP has been integrated out. So if I integrate out this GP, then I end up with a Gaussian distribution with a certain mean and a certain covariance um, number. So those are now numbers, those are function. So the posterior is over functions. My posterior predictive distribution again is over numbers. And in a way, this is already something that we did already for the linear regression, for the Bayesian linear regression. It's exactly the same thing. And I said like it's super simple, integrate the GP out, integrate the function F out. We will never do this explicitly, okay? We only match terms and make them look nice, that's it. So I don't know how to integrate out a function, but that's in principle something that you should do here, right? You have a, a distribution over functions and in order to get this expression, maybe let me write it out once on the board so that you see why it's so weird. So um, where do I do it? Ah, oh, let's do it over here. So in principle, when we have the P of Y star given my data and given observations and given now a new locations, yeah, then by the um, sum rule, I could introduce now my GP stuff. So I have the X, the Y, and the X star. And now comes my function F, right? Times the prior, uh, not the prior, but the posterior distribution after seeing the data. And then I integrate out the function. And I can write it down like this, but the integration of our functions, ah, that's kind of, that's not clear to me how, how I would really define it, right? So in principle, this is how I want to have it, right? With my nice Bayesian formalism. But yeah, that's the difficulty here. So I can't really 
this is this I don't know maybe some mathematicians know how to do this so there are probably ways to integrate over functions and all these things typically in practice when I observe this typically we are then not talking at the end of integrals of functions but we have parameterized our function and then we can integrate over all parameters okay so that's something I could imagine but integrating really over functions that's kind of difficult so this is a bit fishy to write down even okay nonetheless it gives you good intuition right so this is a typical way we do bayesian inference what we did is basically we applied the sum rule to get the parameter f right on the right hand on the left hand side and then we use the product rule to split it into two terms where one is the posterior distribution and the other one is the likelihood good so far so good so the goal will be to find out what are these posterior parameters and what are the posterior predictive parameters okay and that's the whole story what's written on the slide so that's that's everything now what only we are missing are those parameters and that will be the rest of the lecture okay good let's start with another view so let's start with Bayesian linear regression that we've seen already previously okay and let's view Bayesian linear regression as a special case of a Gaussian process. And then we write it all nicely down for Bayesian linear regression. And we kind of, by mixing and matching terms, we are generalizing it to the functions. And that is exactly how um, they are also doing it in this book. So in the book, in the first um, in chapter, let's see where it is. So in, in chapter two, they have two views. They have the so-called weight view for GPs, and then they have the so-called function view, okay? So the weight view is just the Bayesian linear regression. Weight view, because we are explicitly talking here about some weights of some linear regression function. And then there's a function view where I'm now generalizing it to functions, okay? And basically, that's where I got all my information from. So if there's something unclear how I explain it, look at the book additionally, and then you see maybe, oh yeah, he didn't understood everything in the lecture, that's fine, but now I see from the experts, they know how to explain it better. So that can happen. Sometimes also the opposite happened, at least for me. I found other sources of stuff that I didn't understand in the book. But that's how it always is. It depends on, on your where you're starting. Okay, so Bayesian linear regression. How do we get now, where are the distributions of our functions? So suppose now we have a Gaussian prior on our parameter w and we model our unknown function as we did before. We have some feature function phi of x transpose times w. So the phi of x takes a vector and it outputs another vector. Okay, And that's the same feature function that was used to motivate the kernel, kernel trick. And it's the one where we also showed that linear regression is not always linear, but it could be nonlinear if you use like these monomials in here, like taking x, the first coordinate to the power of two or to the power of three and so on and so forth. Curiously, if you choose your unknown function f like that, yeah, then f is actually dis uh, distributed according to a Gaussian process. And one can show that the mean function can be written as phi of x transpose times mu, which is the mean of my weight, um, weight vector, and my covariance function here can be written as phi of x transpose times the covariance matrix of my weight vector, okay? So again, let's go through this. So the starting point is that I'm doing typical Bayesian linear regression. So I'm having a prior on my w, which is finite vector. So this is a parametric method. Um, I can define a function yeah, by just passing the, the input here into my feature function and multiplying it with my parameter vector to get a single number. And curiously, now one can show that the f is distributed according to a Gaussian process. So that's nice because we know how to do Bayesian linear regression and we also know the, the, all the expressions for this, for getting the posterior. And all we have to do is go through the um, notation again and then read off the posterior functions from the solutions, okay? So that it's compatible with the Bayesian linear regression. And then hope for the best that that's the right way to do it. But typically, we have to choose one way to do it, and the one that's compatible with the simpler stuff is quite often the solution. And here it's the case. So 
Gaussian processes viewed very general is I can choose an arbitrary mean function. So it doesn't have to look like this. Okay. Also my arbitrary covariance function, it doesn't have to look like that one. Okay. So again, if we generalize this far enough, yeah, then this is basically like an instance of the kernel trick. In, in the kernel trick, um, the, the key was, so the insight was instead of defining a feature function explicitly phi of x, and then having a certain way of doing your inference, in this case now using this function, now the key insight was that instead of only considering kernel functions that have this form, yeah, we could also consider kernel functions where we can just show the property of positive definiteness, but that don't really look like necessarily like that, but which we define completely different, that have a completely different, more general form, maybe with Fourier transform or whatever, okay? And here the same thing happens. So in a way, the GP is a generalization like of the old feature-based method with finitely many features. Uh, now the GP is allowing us much more flexibility. Good, so far so good. Um, here's again the story. So for Bayesian linear regression, if we would apply to this setup now, and we would say, um, let's model our function that we want to learn about as this feature times my weight vector. Then basically these inferences that I said before, get the posterior distribution for the W and get the posterior predictive distribution for the Y star. And this we've done already. So how do we do it? So let's write it down a bit more precisely. So let's write down a prior for the parameters and let's have a likelihood um, where the likelihood here now um, is curiously, it's basically the same as we use for the GPs. Here I just wrote it down for more than one data point. But if you would write it down for a single data point, then basically this is exactly the same expression that we had before. However, I see here that I'm a bit mixing notation. So to be more, more consistent, maybe I should have written this down here with phi of x times w. So I'm flipping back and forth. So this could be streamlined a bit. Anyway, we have a formula now to get the posterior distribution, which was this monster, okay? It looks a bit intimidating, but actually it fully makes sense. So now my new belief about my parameter, so my posterior mean is a combination of the old mean and of the observed data, okay? And somehow depending on my initial variance that I have, I trust my initial mean more or less. So if my variance was very large, the inverse will be very small and I don't trust my W very much and I will more look at the data. If my W star was very small variance, the inverse will be very large and so on. Now, what about this VN? So the VN is kind of renormalizing these weights, right? So the variance here in front of the W can be arbitrarily large. So I need to renormalize it somehow with these variance by taking the inverse of the inverse. Okay, so here I'm having the weight is kind of the inverse of a matrix. So I take the inverse of the inverse of the matrix. Now, what about the other term? Oh, that is just the other weight that I'm using for the other one, okay? And then it has exactly this form has been derived elsewhere by, by, from our lecture where we had with the um, Gaussian distributions. So what's the difficulty here? The difficulty here is that in this lecture, we are constantly changing notation, that sometimes we call it V star, sometimes we call it V, sometimes we call it W. The reason being, now here I'm more or less following this book, and in this book, they, I think they use V-star, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm kind of following their chapter here. Um, the posterior predictive distribution could be also derived. Again, how do we do it? So here now we can write it nicely down as I did on the board, because here now my function f is represented by a finite dimensional vector, and I know how to integrate finite dimensional vectors, okay? So that is just, again, some rule introducing the W on the left-hand side here and then using the product rule to factor it into the prior or in this case into the posterior distribution and the likelihood, okay? And one can show if you multiply two Gaussians and you integrate out the parameter, you will get a Gaussian distribution where here I'm using the wrong font, okay? And you get a particular mean and you get a particular covariance 
in this case, only a variant since we only have a single data point. Okay, so far so good. Now let's get from parametric to non-parametric regression model. So instead of having just a parametric model where I'm having here like a function that is parameterized by finite dimensional vector, in general, I could say my f is a GP and all the other things are now functions. So the m is a function, the k is a function too. Now you might wonder, so what is this, um, this thing about parametric and non-parametric model? I just want to, so my understanding from reading books is following, so in statistics, a parametric model is a model that has finitely many parameters, where finitely many parameters means there are finitely many numbers which are describing the model, okay? So an example would be the W is a finite dimensional vector. So Bayesian linear regression is an example of a parametric model, okay? Now here's a non-parametric model. It's when we have infinitely many parameters. So my parameter in a GP is F, right? And we as computer scientists, we are fine, right? So the F just has a function type, that's okay. It's still a single object. However, it's not a single number. And since it's not a single number, the whole thing is now a non-parametric model. So how many parameters does it have? In principle, the space of function is really, really large, right? For every number on the real line, I can choose a number. So I have even uncountably many numbers which I can tweak here, okay? So it's definitely infinite. However, also if we have countably many parameters, we would call the whole thing already non-parametric. And an, a, an, a famous example here is the parameter alpha for support vector machines, yeah? Let's look at it. It's from the from a finite dimensional vector space R to the N, where the N is the number of data points. So also that is an example of a non-parametric model because the number of parameters is not finite with respect to the size of the data set. So finitely many parameters here could be more specific to say it should be finite with respect to the number of data points. So a support vector machine the number of parameters increases with the number of data points. Yeah, so there is no fixed number such that it's a model for um, my, my classification problem, but it's a non-parametric model. Again, I think the uh, distinction here, okay, it typically means non-parametric models are a mess, right? You are talking about functions, about high dimensions, about much more complicated existence results. Everything is really getting complicated. And in the parametric world, everything is nice and cozy. You're just talking about 10 numbers, okay? And that's it. So those are the numbers that you need to estimate. So what about a neural network? A neural network, when you write it down, is a parametric model, of course, right? Because you have finitely many parameters. However, if you look at AlexNet or these uh, ResNet 101 or so, it could go into the billions, right? I mean, you could have, really many, many, many parameters. And so it doesn't mean that a parametric model is inflexible. So it just depends on the function that you're writing down. In a way, the non-parametric model exists only on paper and pencil calculations. So when you have a piece of paper on your desk, you can write down a Gaussian process really nice and you can prove something about it and maybe also do Bayesian inference with it. But then when you want to do concrete computations, again, typically you go back to finitely many data points or, and then also to finitely many um, numbers. So you have, uh, yeah, you have matrices and you have vectors and all these things to fit into memory. So when you concretely compute things, typically everything collapses down into the finite world and everything is Gaussian anyway, okay? Good, so that is the distinction between parametric and non-parametric distributions. Um, Again, here also, one could also write down the predictive distribution, which I didn't do, but it's very similar from the stuff on the previous slides. Good, now what's the plan? So I think you already bought it that the GPs, I'm telling you, have also very nice, uh, are also a nice example where you can do Bayesian inference. So where you basically start with the GP and then the posterior distribution will be a GP again. Um, in a way, it's a generalization of Bayesian linear regression in the same fashion as the kernel trick is kind of generalizing like a simple linear SVM to the nonlinear space, okay? Of course, the linear regression is already nonlinearized by using feature functions. So 
the, the correspondence is not, not completely ideal. What still needs to be done is, let's write out the posterior predictive distribution for the Bayesian linear regression, and then let's try to rewrite it with a mean function into a kernel function so that we can extract like general expressions that we can then implement later on, okay? So again, let's fix some notation and I think I'm following here the book. So we are given some data points and here I'm writing a capital N for the number of data points and a capital, of, uh, uh, um, a capital M for the dimensionality of the input locations. We want to learn some mapping from X to Y and we parameterize it for now as in the linear Bayesian regression case, okay? Then what about the generative model now? So the generative model here is, how do I generate a random F from my distribution here? I'm just generating a random W from my initial Gaussian distribution. And then I could generate a random measurement Y for a certain location. So that is generating data. Now, what about this stuff down here? So this is just very explicitly writing out for every object that you see here, the correct dimensions. So when you want to implement something, you really should be sure that everything has the right dimension. So let's go, go through it. First of all, the W and the mu in this case, they are from the R to the F. So what is this F? The F is the dimensionality of my W or the F is the number of features that I have. So in this case, the mean here is not coming from the space of locations like the mean function or something. But here I'm talking about a Gaussian distribution over the parameters. So my mean here should be also from the same space. Similarly, the covariance function sigma here is coming from the same space. Now, what about my, my vector y? So y is basically a long vector where I'm putting all the different observations for different locations in. So that is, in this case, I write it now as a column vector here. So y1 to yn, okay? But there are other ways to write it down. Then there's this function phi. So the function phi is taking a data point from R to the M and it's outputting a vector that has the same dimensionality as the W, right? Why? Because I want to calculate the inner product with W. So they should happen to be in the same space. Or with other words, this is saying the W must have enough dimensions so to match the number of features that I'm considering. Now the capital phi here in this case is a matrix of observations. So that's an F times N matrix. And again, I'm following here the common notation on paper and slides where the first dimensionality is a feature and the second is the number of data point. However, in typical implementations, you swap them. And the implementations I will show you will also swap them, okay? So there you always have to be careful. And then there's the capital X, which are basically now all my data points in one big matrix. And then there's the covariance matrix lambda, which is typically just the diagonal matrix, the identity matrix where I'm putting a sigma on each of them. So this is like saying each of the measurements, so each coordinate here, yeah, is independent of all the other measurements. And each measurement basically, um, uh, is, is this standard deviation uh, sigma, okay? So here's a particular um, way. So suppose now for a single data point, I could also write y given w comma x. So a single instance, and that's a Gaussian distribution with this sigma square, as I just said, okay? If I have several data points, I can also kind of collect all the information into this matrix notation. So nothing really difficult here. Um, Often mathematics, I think it's often only difficult because of notation. So that's typically a hurdle. But then when you jump over the hurdle and you get the notation and you go through it one by one, you see, ah, it's just like the Gaussian distribution. There's nothing special going on here, okay? Okay, now let's change the notation. So now what's happening from this slide to that slide? I'm using slightly nicer notation. And so what's happening here, let's see. Um, so let me flip it back and forth. So the mu and the sigma, I find it confusing. So let's use the w0 and v0 being the zero meaning I haven't seen any data, okay? And so I have um, a vector here as the initial vector, which is typically zero. And I have some covariance matrix, which could be like circular, symmetric or something, whatever, iso isotropic or something. And similarly, they flip over here. So what else did I change? 
I gave now my test point here, I gave it a name. So my test point is typically called X star and Y star. Okay, so that's it. Now I could write it down <clears throat> the generative model in this notation with this tilde notation. We've seen it very often already. I could either write it conditioned on X or I could condition on the phi. Now you might wonder, so why doesn't he just decide which notation to use? The reason is those are the notations that I've seen in papers and that I've seen in the book. And they are sometimes mixed or in different papers you use different one. But it, you shouldn't be confused. They really mean the same thing, okay? Why is it the same thing? Because phi is a deterministic function, right? From x to phi. So it doesn't really do something probabilistic here. So I can just replace the x with the variable phi as well. Another way to write it down is with p's. So this is again the same stuff, but written now with p of some things, okay? And similarly here, if I have lots of observations here, down here, I can't mark it, then it corresponds to the product of all these single ones. So this is just like it's always be, just spelled out for you. Okay, we can also now draw the graphical, uh, this generative model as a graphical model, okay? And um, this picture is useful to understand in the, in the derivation that will happen here, to understand why can I cross out here some variables, okay? That's why it's important to see this graphical model. So this graphical model is also useful to understand the derivations in the book. So let's see, what did I write here? So first of all, there are black variables and then there are white variables. So the black ones are the ones that I'm observing or that I'm choosing, okay? So I'm choosing a certain test location. And for the certain test location, there is some function value. The next confusing thing here is, so what is this f sub star? Is it like a function? No, here it is f sub star is a function value. So it's evaluating f at location x star. So where, why am I mixing it? Because the f star is the notation they're using in the book. Okay, so in this case, it's not a function, but it's a function value. Similarly, this one, f sub x1 is the function f evaluated at location x1. Okay, again, I'm spending most of my time talking about notation, okay? And, but, but there's nothing deep happening here. Now, what about the phi's? So the phi's are now the features for a certain data point, okay? And in principle, I could say, okay, I, I have given in my data set the xi, so that means I'm also given my phi of xi. So that's why I put a black box over here. Now, what about the y's? They are also given, but they are not given for the posterior predictive distribution later on. Okay, so I'm not given for the y over here. Good, now what's the interesting structure here? So there's a common parameter w. So there's a common function which is generating all these functional values given these inputs, okay? So why is it interesting? Because it's curious now to follow the path here. So suppose I, I know w, then if I know w, suddenly, all these variables here become independent because they are all deseparated through the W, right? In particular, if I know W, yeah, then all this information from my data set is telling me nothing about the F star. So if I know the true W already, yeah, it's irrelevant whether I see data or not. However, if I don't know the W, so if it's white, yeah, then suddenly this data points together with those ones, they are no longer deseparated from the F star, which makes sense, right? I mean, having seen many examples, of course, I can infer functional values at new locations. And um, curiously, here you need this deseparation rule, the difficult one. So you have a V structure from phi two to this one to W, and this is actually always deseparating the phi two and the W. However, I'm observing a descendant of this V structure. I'm observing the Y too. And for that reason, suddenly this path of information is open. And so there's information flowing to the W, okay? So you can read this all off for the simple regression example. I will flip back to the slide once we need it. Okay, now I said we derive a formula for this um, posterior predictive, or in this case, the posterior predictive distribution would be the distribution over the y star, right? The one with the measurement noise. But we stop one step earlier. We look at the function value of a new data point, And we are interested of the distribution for that one. And here we are talking about 
Bayesian linear regression. So everything is finite and here's nothing bad going on. So let's see whether we can approximately write it up nicely. So first of all, I have a new location and I want to have this function value at this location and I'm giving some training data, which is over here. By extending by using the sum rule, yeah, I'm putting the W in here and integrating it out again. Then I'm using the product rule and moving the W to the other side, but having then here basically the W on the left-hand side with all the conditions on the right-hand side. And now we can cross out some stuff. So let me argue. So one thing I argued already, the functional value of F star, yeah, given a new location and the parameter vector does not depend on the data anymore. The reason being that if I observe the W, then all my data here is deseparated from F star. Okay, so from the graphical structure, I can see why that's the case. So that's why I can omit it. So it's independent of those. So what about this reasoning here? So the W and the phi star and the phi and the y, why does it not at all depend on the location phi star? So the reason being, so um, this f, this phi star here, yeah, if you look at the path from phi star to w, you see that we have a v structure over here where we have no observations in the descendants. So this f star by not observing it and not observing any of the descendants, it's blocking the path from phi star to w. Okay, or with other words, the W doesn't care for the locations of my test data, right? Why does the W not care for the locations of the test data? Because we don't give it the information of the values, right? The locations only get interesting for my W here when I know a value that I obtained, okay? For locations where I don't have a value, I don't care where the locations are. So the W depends only on my observed training data and it does not depend on whether I want to extrapolate into the year 2032 or whether I want to interpolate to the 10th of January 2022 or something. Okay, so that's why I can omit the phi star. Okay, now rewriting this probability here is that there is nothing random going on, but it's just so the phi star times w, which is this expression here, is determining the functional value at the location f star. So if I know the w and I know the location, I can put it into my calculator and I can calculate f star. Now, what about a possible random observation y sub star? So that's a different story. That would be a node down here, okay? So the node down here is Gaussian distributed with mean f star and variant sigma star, the measurement um, noise, okay? But if I know my correct w and if I know a specific location the function value is fully determined. So that's why I'm having here a delta function. I could have written here Ivers in brackets as well. So that would have been the same thing. And now this is again now a weird calculation, right? Integrating out a w against this this delta thing. So I couldn't continue this thing here. Okay. So it should just give you some intuition that you can get to this thing. And I think that's one of the steps in the book. Yeah, but then a miracle occurs and somehow now we know from other things, okay, that basically this can be calculated and to be shown that this is a Gaussian distribution at the end. So one can show that integrating a Gaussian over W against some delta expression leads to a certain Gaussian distribution. And which one is it? It is this thing, which is, I think, the new high score. This is a new winner for the most complicated expression regarding Gaussian distributions we've seen so far. But again, don't be afraid. It's just the same thing as always, okay? So let's look at it, at it a little bit. So what is it now? We are talking about the functional value of F star at a new location phi star, okay? So given that we've seen some data, so what is this location? So this first expression here is the mean and the second expression is the standard as uh, the, the variance of my estimate. Okay, so let's first look at the mean. So the mean is a combination of the first term, which is just plugging in for the W. Okay, so here should be a W zero. Okay, great, I'm messing up notation again. 
So my initial W, if I haven't seen data, was W sub zero, or on previous slides I called it mu. So this is my first guess if I haven't seen any data. And now plus yeah, something, which is like the difference between two things. So these are the function values at my locations x, okay, and I weight them in a particular way. I weight them by comparing basically the phi sub x with my location. So I'm checking, so this is basically calculating now a kernel function, which is calculating the similarity between the test location and the data location. And then again, the thing in the middle here is some weird normalization. Again, this is the initial variance we have and we subtract basically the similarity that it that my test point has with the data, okay? We will chew on this function a little bit more. So let's rewrite it first to simplify it a little bit. So do we really need these features explicitly? And now comes um, some nice rewrite. So let's rewrite it with some clever notation. So first of all, let's call this guy over here, let's call it m sub x star. Yeah, so that is this expression. So what is it intuitively meaning? So if I'm not thinking of GPs, yeah, I'm having a GP which has a mean function and the mean function, the prior mean function is giving me like the default value. And so the mean um, function as we've seen already was plug in the mean of the parameter w and do your calculation. And so this is like a very suggestive way of writing m of x star. So this is a mean function evaluated as x star or more explicitly written saying m which is a vector now or a number in this case sub x star so evaluated at x star but I'm using a suggestive notation here. Similarly, I can use a suggestive notation for all my data locations that I've seen. So that is just applying this thing to the mu. Okay, so that is the m sub x. Similarly, for the for this expression over here now, I can use kind of a kernel trick style thing and call this, this is a kernel function evaluated at x star and x star. But again, I'm not really having here a kernel function. I'm just giving this real number a very suggestive name. And similarly, I have a suggestive name for this expression, which is the kernel function evaluated at x star and all locations of my data set. So those are really vectors and matrices and scalars, and they're getting some nice names. And now if I plug them in here, the expression gets already nicer looking, okay? So you have some initial mean, and then you have like some mean of the data set that you would calculate if you don't see y's and you compare it with the y's. So you have like a certain correction that you do here. So for every data point here, I'm doing a certain correction, right? To the mean that I would get without seeing data. And that is weighted depending on how similar my test point is to my data set, okay? Again, notice the minus sign over here. That is also very important. So my prior variance of my observation gets decreased if my location that I'm testing at is very similar to the locations where I'm having data. Okay, good. I hope approximately clear. Now let's replace this notation now with the mean function. Now is where we're kind of starting to pattern match functions for vectors. So Let's define a mean function. So let's say we have this function here going from R to the M to R. Yeah. For example, we had that one for the Bayesian linear regression. Now we could define for the X one that this vector here is basically the value at this mean function. Similarly, if I have a whole data set, I could say the M sub X is basically evaluating my mean function at all these different locations. So what properties do I have here for the M? Does it have any requirements, okay? What I did here was, I'm starting with the Bayesian linear regression expression. I replace it with some constant things that have a suggestive notation and then now I'm replacing it with a function. So does it have any properties? No, it can be any function, there's no requirement. Why am I stressing it here? Because for covariance functions, it's very different. So again, I'm doing the same steps yeah, 
So for the Bayesian linear regression, that is the covariance function. And now let's define um, basically the k sub x, whoops, I can't mark it properly, to be like this kernel one, the, the, the kernel evaluated at x1 and x2. Then I could have this notation k sub x star x to be this row vector and have it the other way around, I get this column vector, okay? So basically on the right hand side of my kernel, I plug in a whole data set, yeah? And on the left hand side, I'm plugging in a single vector. This will generate me either a row vector or a column vector, depending on in which order I'm doing it. If I plug in matrices in both sides, I'm getting the corresponding covariance matrix. Good, what are the requirements on K? Of course, K must be a positive semi-definite function, yeah, for any, uh, K must be a positive semi-definite function, which means that the matrix K sub XX must be positive semi-definite for any X. So that is the same as saying, pick your X arbitrarily, plug it into the kernel function and the matrix must be positive semi-definite. Again, that's a recall of the definition. Yeah, and here's again the statement, these functions are also called kernel functions or positive definite kernels or positive semi-definite kernels or Mercer kernel or covariance functions, all the same stuff, okay? Actually, that's kind of, there's some beauty in here. So there are the kernel people talking about support vector machines and are super happy about their kernel trick. And then there's the Bayesian world who says, ah, nah, support vector machines, yeah, they work very well, but the algorithm is a bit ad hoc. We are believers of base rule. Everything must be derived with base rule, okay? So we are always doing posterior distributions, even if you can't compute them. That's the right way of thinking, and we don't want to do anything else. And curiously, also in the world of Bayesian thinking, something like the kernel function pops out of nowhere. Now, out of nowhere is a bit exaggerated, but the same tricks here apply and the same nice ideas happen to be. So it can be that you are in a conference and then there are, uh, let's say you are 20 years ago at a conference in year, year 2002, then there's a guy from the kernel world giving a, a, a talk, talking about kernel functions, how to get new from old ones and whatever. And then comes the next talk from a GP person and a Bayesian person and that person will talk about covariance functions and how they are great and having nice properties. And they're talking about exactly the same thing, right? And of course they are not stupid, they are aware of it, right? They are clever, clever people. Why is the Bayesian person calling it covariance function? Because they are saying, I mean, it is a covariance, right? It must be, it's a covariance of a Gaussian process. So why should I call it kernel function, right? I mean, it's a covariance function. That's a much better name for it than a kernel function. The, G, uh, the support vector machine people, they use the word kernel functions because there are some prominent physicists among them and they know function and analysis very well. And for them, it's a Mercer kernel, okay? So for them, the most natural way to describe it is calling it a kernel function. Good, quick recap. So distribution over functions. So for Bayesian linear regression, we can view them as Gaussian processes. So since we have a randomness here in the parameter, in a way, we have a randomness on the function, okay? And curiously, this randomness leads to a Gaussian process distribution. However, we can view it much more general. And instead of plugging in these particular choices, we can plug in any function for the M and semi-definite functions for the kernel functions, okay, for the GP. Um, so the Gaussian process thing is generalizing in a way this Bayesian linear regression. Um, so we derived this nice formula here. And why is this formula now well-behaved? So this formula is well-behaved because this is a distribution of a scalar number and all the participants here are vectors and matrices. So this is like something we can trust. Even though in the derivation, there was a miracle that, that occurred at some point where we had this weird delta function under the integration. Um, are we done yet? No, of course. Now we want to plug in here these functions. And in particular, we not only want to have these posterior predictive distribution, but we want to have the posterior distribution like written for the GP, okay? We still want to have these things. And that's the next thing that I want to show you. I basically show you the results. So first let's start with the posterior predictive mean and variance, okay? So um, here, on the top, I always write the same stuff now on the next two slides. 
So we have a prior over functions. We have a certain likelihood with the Gaussian distribution, and we are interested in the posterior predictive distribution. In particular, now we are interested in expression for these things. And we know this formula that we derived, okay? And then we can read off basically now by plugging in, now um, giving it a new name, mu sub n and sigma squared sub n, yeah? We can just read off the answers from these expressions here, okay? And now if you have a general GP, yeah, you would write here m of x star and k of x comma x. Maybe I should add a slide where I change this. But here comes now the posterior mean and covariance function, like the functional view of it. Again, the first stuff is the same as before. And now by replacing now these vectors in here and the matrices with functions, we get now a mean function and a covariance function of the posterior GP. Okay, so if f is a GP with mean function m and k, now after seeing data, I'm getting a new mean function, and that is the one that is following the data, and I'm getting a new covariance function, that is one that is kind of telling us how sure we are, okay? And we can explicitly write down here an expression. So let's see how this thing is a function. So where is the input? The input is x. The x gets fed into the initial mean function. So that can be computed. Sure, if I have an x, I can compute that one. Now, what about the expression in the back? Where is the little x? So the little x is only over here, okay? And the rest is something I can calculate. So the y is a vector of 100 observations. The m sub x is a vector of 100 mean values that I would calculate without seeing data. And then the difference is a vector of size 100. My kernel matrix here is 100 by 100 matrix for 100 data points plus sigma squared along the diagonal for regularization or since it follows from the Bayesian regression and I take the inverse of that one. So the thing on the right hand side here is basically a vector. Yeah. So I can calculate once and for all the inverse of this matrix and multiply it with this vector. And then the mean function is calculating now basically the similarity of my new test point with all my data set. So this is then a hundred dimensional vector that I multiply with another hundred dimensional vector. And that is then the answer for the mean function. Now, what about the kernel function? Now, is that a function of x and x prime? It's a function of x and x prime because I'm first evaluating the initial variance that I had before at the beginning and then minus now this expression where the first one is calculating um, <clears throat> the similarity of my data point to my data set and the last one is calculating the similarity of the other data point to the data set and that is then kind of combined into a variance here. So basically the, the first x might be very similar to my data, but the x prime is very dissimilar to the data, then the overall will be very, very small. So the overall variance or the covariance between the data point x and x prime, given the data, is not changing very much from the a priori covariance that I have. However, if my x is similar to the data and my x prime is similar to the data, then this expression is something reasonably large and it will decrease the prior variance that I had before. So now they are co-varying more than before. So maybe initially x and x prime are not co-varying very much, but then after I've seen the data, maybe they are co-varying a lot. Good, so far so good. Let's have a quick look at how we could implement it. And I must say my implementation is still a bit buggy, so it doesn't work very well. But during the lecture, I got an insight where one of my bugs is. Nonetheless, I hope you learned something from the implementation. So first of all, um, so those are the links to the books, by the way. So this is a um, book that there's a general, general page on Gaussian processes. Um, David Duvenot has a really nice page in Cambridge. Yeah, you see again, Great Britain. Great Britain likes Bayesian inference and Bayesian statistics. That's why it's from there. Carl Rasmussen, University of Edinburgh, uh, no, Carl Rasmussen is now University of Cambridge, but if I recall right, he was a PhD student of 
Chris Williams at University of Edinburgh, and Philip Hennig, a former colleague of mine, with whom I gave a similar lecture like that one already in Tübingen at some point. Um, he's also a PhD student from um, uh, David Mackay, the late David Mackay in Cambridge. So this is all very British that we have seen here. So Bayesian inference is very, very popular on the British island. That's why the names are somehow all have a relationship to UK. Um, he wrote a nice paper on how to animate them and we will look at it next time, but not today. And then there's a very nice visualization, which I also show you next time, but you can already play around with it. But let me first show you my implementation. So again, I want to base everything on NumPy. Okay, that's why I'm using this one. Let's start with the covariance functions. So the covariance functions, I want to implement in such a way that they either could be that you could input two locations, a location A and B, and it would calculate a single number, or you could input a whole data set A and a whole data set B, and it should output the whole kernel matrix. <clears throat> oh, let's start with the third one. So that is the squared exponential kernel. And so the input is one location and another location and some hyperparameters. And this one is also known as the Gaussian kernel function in the kernel world. But the Bayesians, they like to call it squared exponential. Why do they want to use a, call it squared exponential? Because the word Gaussian is already overused. So we use Gaussian already for the measurement likelihood and we use Gaussian already for the named processes. So that's why having additionally a Gaussian kernel function here would be really weird and confusing. So we call it squared exponential. So um, sometimes it's also, yes, I forgot where I got this one. Actually, it's an exponentiated square. It's not a squared exponential. So we don't square the exponential, but we take the expo exponential of a square. So that's, but that's like a special detail. Let's see how we calculate it. It's something like, e to the minus r squared divided by some variance here. And what is the r2? So the r2 are all the square distances between a and b. So I, if I have two data points, I will get a single square distance and I say e to the minus the square distance divided by some variance, okay? Um, if I have two data sets and the square distances will be a big matrix and um, I say e to this big matrix but component wise and so I get the Gaussian um, kernel matrix with this function over here. And then there's some Python uglities. Sometimes you want scalar, sometimes you want to have matrices. So that's always confusing for me. So I don't know whether there's a better way to implement it. So, and then there are other kernels here that I also implemented. Maybe let's look at it next time. I first want to show you the rest of the implementation. So here's a simple data set. Okay, so what is my data set? It basically consists of X and Y. Yeah, and in this case, I also set a mean and a kernel function as a prior that goes very well with the data set because I can't remember for the other data set what was good choices. I want to put it here into this if block. And so here, what is my mean function? <clears throat> I'm just calculating the mean of my values and I say my function here is just a constant function. As you know, I really like functional programming. So why not really represent the mean function now as a function, right? So that's why I'm using here the lambda notation. What about the prior covariance function? So here I want to use the squared exponential kernel. However, I want to have a concrete function that only takes A and B and hyperparameters. And so, ah, okay, now I want to rename it. So I basically, I want to call it prior cov function and now this is basically renaming it. Actually, by looking at it, I could have written it just like that. So squared exponential kernel of nothing. Okay, so that would be another way to write it down. So just one function gets assigned to the other one. Good, if I look at the data, um, this is now, whoops, plotting the data set. So those are my points that I want to regress on. Let me show you quickly the other data sets. So here's another data set. Um, let's just look at it. Okay, it's some weekly function. I think, what is it one? Is it maybe the, yeah, properly, it's the exchange rate between the British pound and the Euro, okay. Fitting to the British heritage of all this stuff. And here you see smooth functions are maybe not always what you want. So sometimes maybe the truth is spiky, okay. 
And then just having some smooth or straight line or something might not be the right thing. Maybe you need something else. And there are kernel functions for that, the so-called Matean kernel. So here's another data set. So this is the CO2 data. And here you see um, from 1965 to 2009, you see some up and down and up and down. So what is this up and down? Let me show you. So the up and down is always going through one year. And the more you know about geophysical sig or biogeophysical signals, like if you have um, uh, like a big forest, for example, then the forest, when it grows, it captures a lot of CO2. And then towards the winter, when everything, the, the, the leaves are falling down and the fields rot for themselves, they kind of release CO2 as well. So it's really going up and down and up and down. That's how it, how it is. And that's also what on Hawaii at the Mauna Loa thing is really happening. Why measure it on the Mauna Loa on Hawaii? Because this is like a nice measure point, which is far away from industry and other things. So it's just like in the middle of a big Pacific, right? Of the Pacific Ocean. And it's like a very interesting number to measure. Okay, and you see it's going up and down and up and down and up and down. And um, curiously, so how do I get back here? So like this, you really see a trend here, right? And I'm not exaggerating the axis. It's going from 320 to 390, which is really significant. Now, what can GPs do for us here? So now GPs, we will see next time how we could model this really nicely. So we could have one kernel function, which is picking up the periodic stuff. And then we will have another, maybe a linear kernel, which is in computing the trend over here. And then there might be some other kernel, which is getting rid of some, some seasonal stuff, some, some Gaussian kernel. And they can be combined into a single model. And then by looking at the learned parameters with model selection, as we see next time, one can see and one can infer something, maybe also for the future. Anyway, but let me first start with the first data set, the simple one, so that one with only 10 points. Since today I only want to show you the implementation, and I must admit it's not completely bug free, so I couldn't solve it all yet. Next, I want to represent my GP as an object. So I want to say GP of a prior function and a prior covariance, prior mean function, prior covariance function. That should be a single object. And in Python there I learned there's this collections.name tuples. And that's like a nice thing to get an immutable object with two slots M and K, which is just leading to really nice code, right? A GP is parameterized by a mean function, a covariance function. It would be nice kind of to put a bracket around it and then to have named arguments for them. And that is what a collections.name tuple is doing for you. It's standard Python, which I wasn't aware of. Okay, next comes from prior to posterior. And here's the math. So starting with this GP, I want to have the posterior GP where I'm just rewritten the formula that we've seen on the slides, okay? And um, here's my implementation and I must admit the implementation is not super clever yet, so I can improve it, but let's go through it. First of all, I'm calculating the m sub x vector, which is now taking from the GP input, the g dot m. So that is the collections dot neum tuple feature so that I can go through these different slots and get the mean function and apply it to my data. Then I can calculate the kernel matrix for my data. And now I can also calculate this kx, which still has some open um, input here. So I later on want to define my posterior covariance function using the kx of a, where the a is one of the inputs. And then I also plug it in the kx of b, where the b is the other input, okay? And it's basically the function that measures the similarity to my data set. Then I typically by convention, I say the last parameter is the noise variance and the other parameters are the parameters of the kernels that I'm using. And I need to pre-calculate here this Z inverse. Yeah, the Z inverse, typically you don't do this, but instead you use like these tricks, like this NP linalg solve stuff. But here I'm later on, I want to calculate, do these calculations for a hundred data points. And then I would have to do this computation over and over again. So better I'm doing this in version once. But actually while explaining all of this, I figured out this thing over here could be pre-computed actually, right? And 
so this thing here is constant. It doesn't change with A. So maybe I should adjust the code a little bit and write it again here. Let me just do it very quickly. Then you see what I want. So here, the, let's write this expression. Um, and let's use the np linalg solve of z and of y minus m sub x. I think this is even better. And away it goes. And I can plug it in here y m x. So this can be pre computed just. Okay, so this is nice. And here I see another bug in my code. Okay, great. So I, I need the inverse as well. So that inverse np lin alg dot inverse of z. Where do I need it? So I need it over here. Okay, great. So that's another bug that I find while explaining to you. By the way, that's a good trick if you have a bug in your code, explain it to your roommate, right? Doesn't matter whether your roommate studies philosophy or art history, explain it to someone, okay? So that's something. And then you find bugs. Okay, that was the other bug, so maybe it's working now. Okay, anyway, so again, the input here is a GP, my prior GP, and some data and some hyperparameters. And the G here is a combination of two functions, a mean function and a covariance function. And the output will be a new GP with new functions, okay, that then can be used. So this is really Bayesian inference. The input, the prior is a distribution over function. The output is also distribution over function. And curiously, what we get out of here are two finite objects. By the way, why are they finite? They are finite because we are using Python code to represent them. So they are parameterized with Python code, which is kind of beautiful, I think. I think this is pretty cool. Anyway, let's see. Hopefully I didn't put any new bugs in here. So now my prior GP will be this prior mean function and the prior covariance function that I described up there already in the data set. Then my posterior GP I get by calling update GP on my prior GP, okay? Let's see whether it works. No, it doesn't work. Okay. Numpy lin alg has no blah, blah, blah. Okay. How is it called? Inf? Let's hope for the best. Okay. Now it works very well. So now my posterior GP has two functions and those I can now plot. So here's my plot GP function. And maybe now it's also looking better. By the way, there was another bug in here. which I also remembered while talking to you. So now let's hope for the best. So here's my prior GP, my posterior GP. I first scatter plot the data and then I define a range for visualizing the GP. And let's see whether I get like a nice plot. And I get kind of a nice plot. There's still something wrong, okay? There's still something wrong with my plotting routine. Also the variance is everywhere the same. Ah, that's that, but that's something that I'm already struggling with it for a while. Um, hopefully until Wednesday, the whole thing is repaired. Let's see for only three data points, how the whole thing looks, uh, whether it's getting better or whether I can infer something from it. Yeah, it's still looking wrong. Let me just briefly show you how it should look like. So there's this interactive visualization over here, which is much nicer and I will explain to you next time what it really is. So here's one data point, there's the other one, and the other one is far away. And that is the plot that I want to have. I want to have a mean function. <clears throat> maybe let's pause the interpolated stuff, or maybe let's even get rid of it. Uh, plotting options. Nope. So that's the plot I want to have. I want to have the mean function, and then I want to have the standard deviations as something around it. But so far I have still a couple of bugs in my code. But hopefully until next time it's fixed. I will also put it into the public folder. So when you play around with it and go through it maybe line by line trying to understand, yeah, then maybe you see bugs and please tell me on Rocket Chat and I can put it in right away. But maybe I also fix it until Wednesday. But we will also have a look at this nice nice thing which takes a bit more explanation what we see here. Okay, great. So I think that's it for today. Let's end with this wrong solution. So this is not yet the end. 
but we will continue next time. So thanks for your attention and we see each other on Wednesday. Bye bye.